We, it, it, it's, I don't know how you can't be excited about Easter. You know, it used to be when I was little, it was all about the eggs. Are they real eggs or are they plastic eggs? The plastic eggs, we got stuff inside. It could be money. You know, but when I was growing up, it was like a nickel or dime or a quarter. You know, Darren was saying his granddaughter got, it, got $30 in eggs yesterday. Uh, is she tithing on that? Uh, anyway. Next lesson. Praise God. Praise God. All right. You know, and then the real eggs, I was talking with Barbara. I was like, hey, when we, when we raised our kids, we all hid eggs. Did you hide the real ones or the plastic ones? And we always had the real ones, and someone would always step on one. Yes. Or you forgot one. Yes. But in a day or two, you remembered where they were. Yeah. Because those eggs went bad. Yeah. Man, I tell you, the thing I love about Easter is that hundreds of millions of people today are celebrating Jesus with us. Amen. We're doing that together. Hundreds of millions of people today are remembering what he did. Isn't that awesome? Yes. All for literally just rising from the grave. Because as Darren was saying, Pastor Darren was saying, that's the difference. Many people were hung on a cross. But only one came back alive. Think about that. I get so excited. I get goosebumps doing that. Maybe it's the air conditioner. But anyway, I like the... I love that about our Lord and Savior, our King, the King of Kings. Everyone else has to bow the knee, yes. and they will bow the knee. Don't get me wrong. So, anyway, all worshiping Him for the same thing. But for all those hundreds of millions of people, and this is the one thought that the Lord dropped into my heart, and this kind of thing just evolved from this, was for most of those people, the resurrection does not affect their everyday life. It doesn't change their life one bit. I mean, oh, Easter, oh yeah, you know, we're doing a good thing. We're going to church. We're buying dresses for our kids. Buying them new shoes. But the resurrection doesn't change their life day to day. And, that, and that's just, you know, it, it, it's an Easter thing. You know what I mean? Oh, it's Easter. We're going to go and we're going to sing about him for one day. And we're going to go and we're going to, uh, you know, talk to people and show them that we were in church with our, you know, our great clothes and all that stuff. It's an Easter thing. And I grew up in that. However, my mom made sure we knew Easter was about Christ. She made sure of that. And I was like, oh, I was like these kids back here. Woo we're going to children's church. We're getting out of here. <laughs> because I didn't get it, you know, and that's understandable. You know, we're all on milk to an extent, like we talked about last week. But most of those hundreds of millions of people will make a Christmas appearance, an Easter appearance, and depending on what their denomination is, they'll do make different appearances on different days to make their appearance to, oh, got to get that check mark in with God. And it breaks my heart a little bit because they don't know him like we know him. And, and they don't know the sacrifice completely that he made. You know, it's kind of watered down a bit, but... The resurrection basically means nothing to them. And just being honest. And I'm not hammering anybody. I'm saying if we're going to talk about the truth, we need to tell the truth so that we understand it for what it is. Easter is much more than just a day to wear new clothes and to get eggs and throw away those peeps. I don't know. I, you know, the, peep, the peeps look so good until after, you know, like, you know, marshmallow. Pink, yellow, blue, I guess. Anyway, yeah, purple, anyway. I do want to say there is a, there is a however to this, what we're talking about. There are people whose lives are changed and who live day by day knowing what the resurrection is all about. There are people whose lives were just changed radically. And, and, and that's most of you in here, because I know most of you, and I know that it has changed your day-to-day -to -day decision making because of the resurrection. It's not just once a year event. It, it's a day-to-day -day thing, you know, and that's, it's, it's every major decision that they make in life has something to do with what Jesus did for us. And that's where we want to be. That's the, that's, we want to give that example to everyone. We want to be that light to everybody you know, it's just, and it's all based on one fact, and that's that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. 
And if you think about that and you really stop and think about that and say, listen, was dead, then was alive. It's huge. It's huge. That's why when people freak out, when someone's dead for a few moments, you know, CPR, we get the paddles, you know, clear, you know, then they're breathing again. And people are like, ah, oh, they're alive again. Listen, three days. And here's the thing, I don't know if you ever thought about, three days gave him time to go and defeat the enemy, get the keys from hell, defeat death, do all of those things for us. He didn't just die and then 30 seconds later came back and everyone was like, oh, you know, everyone would have been glad and all that. But he had a mission. This is, this is the lion that we were seeing there when he went to hell. He wasn't a lamb anymore. So I want you to think about that. So, so I guess my question today is where are you on that scale? You know, we've got the hundreds of millions who are like, oh, yeah, it's Easter. Look at my shirt. Then you got the people like, oh, there's Easter. No, this is representative of why, how I live my life day to day. So where are you on that scale? And here's the thing is, we, when we always talk about this honesty. We're going to teach the word, boldly proclaim the gospel. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to bend. We're not going to budge. And to do that, you have to be able to receive it in truth and, and be honest with yourself. Are you going to say, yeah, okay, I'm good. You know, you, you know, you're like, crap, he's talking about me. You know, that type of thing. You know, I'm checking some boxes here. But that is the beginning of renewing your mind and, and getting right with the Lord. You have to be brutally honest with yourself. You know, yeah, my parents crammed the Bible down my throat. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of hearing about it. Sick of it. But you know what? You know how many seeds have been crammed down your throat? that are starting to come up a little because you hear and see someone doing something you know is not right and instantly in your spirit, you go, no, no, my mom told me that the word says. And so it's an opportunity for you, but you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself. I don't care what we say from up in this pulpit. I don't care what the Bible says to you. If you're not willing to make a change in your life, it does no good. You have to be willing to say, yes, that's me. I need help or I need to change that area of my life. And that's all of us. I'm not picking on you. I'm saying all of us have areas in our life we're working on. That's right. So where are you on that scale? Do you really believe, now think about this. Do you really believe that he came back alive? Do you really believe that he was resurrected? I'll tell you right now, most of the world does not. They do not believe that. So, in your mind, which is where most of the battle happens, by the way, is your mind saying, come on, you know that can't be real. And, and I was in that position, you know, because the scientists of today want you to understand, oh, there is a scientific reason when you die, chemicals cha or, you know, are changing, they're dying in your brain, these lights will appear to you, you'll see these things, you'll see apparitions, you'll see all these things. He's not asking us to go by proof. He's asking us to go by faith. Amen. That's the difference. That's the difference right there. Do we believe? Do we really believe? Because it was unto salvation that you believe first. So are you really saved? Do you believe that or not? It's by our faith. We weren't there. We didn't see it. But I have enough faith in my God and in that word of God, that what it says is true, 100%, yes. right? Yes. So that's the difference right there, because your mind will lead you so many different directions. Even with a renewed mind, you still have you in there. That you've raised in this world, and you've been brought up in this world, and you know all of these things where you still have that little check sometimes, but it's the people that have been doing this long enough that knows to take every thought captive and instantly press those thoughts down. And I always slam it with a verse. No, for it says. It says. The word says. So, if we, if we really believe this, think about it. If we really believe this, when we take communion, we should be like this militant. Yeah! Come on! 
We got, look what, look what we did. Look what happened to us because of what he did. All my sin, all that garbage in my life was just wiped away by the cross. Think about it. Every time we take communion, that's, you know, I look at it differently. I'm looking at, man, I wish that little wafer tasted like ranch dressing. <laughs> but you know what? That's me. That's me, my, my mind. And I instantly just, it's just consumed with this. Look what Jesus did on the cross. This is representative of him. And I'm just being transparent with you guys. Because you know you think stuff like that. You just will never admit it. <laughs> so, all of that garbage was put to death. And we should be so excited. You know, and, and, and people just don't get it. There's nothing can tear me away from God now. Nothing. Not one thing can do that. All my crimes. All Darren's crimes. <laughs> all those barriers are gone. Right? Are you with me on this? Yes. If anything, yell to be at warm, whatever. But this is today of all days. I mean, every day it's like this. We're always excited. We wake up every day, spend time with the Lord, misty eyed, teary eyed. Yes, thank you. <sighs> but thankful. Yes. Thankful. Think about that. So the resurrection, if I really believe he rose from the grave, that should change everything in my life. It should change. It should impact every area of my life. And just being honest, take an inventory of your life and see, okay, yes, I, I, I do very well when I walk in the church. I do very well when I hear a good message. I am awesome when it comes to praise and worship. But then when I leave and I go home and I turn on HBO or I do these other things, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm not walking with him the way I should be walking with him. Did you know you can grieve the Holy Spirit? So I would say that's an area that we should work on. You know, there's, he just wants to get to know you. He just wants you to talk to him. He just wants you to spend time with him. You know, if it's your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you're dating, you're going to get, you're hoping to get married. You want to get to know them intimately. So you talk about things. Yeah, I was raised here and I had a, had a hard time growing up, you know, here. And, you know, that's getting to know each other. You're sharing details of each other. You're growing together. And that's what the Lord wants. He just wants to talk to you. Amen. He wants to spend time with you. Hmm. Well, there was this guy in the Bible named Saul. Good old Saul lived a very comfortable life. You know, he was very wealthy, had a very successful job, pretty high position, you know, with what he was doing. Matter of fact, he had an experience with God. He was out persecuting Christians. You guys all know the story, right? He was out persecuting Christians, living his life, making very, very good money by persecuting Christians. You know, they would send him on tasks to go, yeah, we heard that there's a, a group of people over here. We need you to check them out. And he could go over there and he would bust them out. He would find them and he would carry them in front of the court. The Sanhedrin there, who was good, right? No. Very powerful man, prominent, comfortable. So he had an encounter with the Lord. And you know what happened? It changed everything in his life. Amen. Right. And he was the, one of the worst of the worst. And he started believing in the resurrection of Christ. He started getting to know about Christ. And it changed everything in his life. And now listen, it changed so much. He went from persecuting people to becoming the most persecuted Christian on the face of the earth. That is night and day. Yeah. That's how it changed his life. Think about that. That's how it should change our lives. It should be the same thing. After being tortured so, offering, so often and sacrificing so much, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are be, to be pitied more than all men. Now, I'm going to read, you know, a little different versions and it's on the screen, but I'm just, 
I want you to understand what he's saying here. He's saying, he goes, you think I'm doing this for fun? I had this great job. I had this great, I, I, I had everything I ever wanted. And then I met Christ. I had an experience with Christ. And now I am the most persecuted person on this planet. Do you think I'm doing this for fun? He goes, you think I would choose to do this? That's what he's saying. You think I'm out here being tortured. Why would I be out here being tortured if there's no life after death? Why would I have changed? Why would I have switched? If there's no life after this one, then I'm the stupidest person on this planet. I had it all. And I gave it up for this. <clears throat> I put everything in this. And if I'm wrong, I just wasted my whole life. Think about that. See, that's the way our life should look if we get it. If we understand that what that resurrection did for us and in our lives. Later in verse 32, he says, If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Think about that. Think about what he's saying. If there's no life after death, that's a great way to live. If there's no life after death, why don't we just go and live life how we want to do it, have the most fun we can have, have the most pleasure we can have, because what's, what's, what's the big deal? Think about that. The smartest thing you can do if there's no life after death is go out and enjoy yourself. Don't worry about hurting other people. We can do anything we want. Don't worry about anything else. Just enjoy yourself. If you're just going to die, this is all meaningless anyway. And of course, I'm just telling you the opposite of what he's saying here is Paul, who stated, because I believe in the resurrection of the dead, because I believe Jesus rose again, that means I'm going to rise from the grave. Think about that. We are going to rise from the grave. My life now is completely different. I'm not going to live for myself or selfies. <laughs> Let's not go back there. <laughs> We're not going to live for that. We're going to live for him. Because there is life after death now. Yes. That's good news, by the way. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ should change the way you view everything on this earth. Why are you working? <clears throat> How much money you have in the bank? Which car are you driving? Now listen, hear my heart. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying if those are the things that you are just focused on, oh, I got to get this promotion. I got to live here. I got I to gotta have a castle in this other country. I have to do all that. If that's your main priority, your, your focus is wrong. Now, when you focus on God, you focus on Jesus and what he put us here on this planet to do. It's amazing how those things are added to you after you've made him the priority. He knows the desires of your heart. And, and, and please, just hear me. Do a self-inventory. What are your priorities? Every decision should be made based on what the resurrection did for you. Matter of fact, when Paul talks about our bodies on earth, it says in verse 36, it says, basically, he's comparing our lives and our bodies to a seed. You know, whether it's wheat or whatever, he's comparing our lives and our bodies to a seed. He says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Think about that. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be. You're planting a seed. And the seed in the ground is the one that produces a whole new life. Think about that. You, you, you don't stick it in the ground to die. You stick it in the ground to live. And he set that example. That's basically what he did. Something else will spring up the true life, the true plant. So when you're looking at that seed, you don't see the true life or, 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 or what's going to come out of that. You have to drop it in the ground, plant it, and then watch the new life come up. 
And that's what Paul is, is basically saying with us. You want your body to go into the ground. You want your body to die. Because guess what? It's going to rise up into something else, something new, something better, something that you can't even really imagine as hard as you try. It's going to be amazing, guys. And when you have that knowledge that Jesus gave us by resurrecting, by his coming back, he is showing us. When he resurrected, he said, look, I told you, I told you, you can believe me. My words are true. Now, they didn't understand it at the time, but afterwards they were like, oh, I get it. I see it. I'm just a seed. And that's all there is to it. This body doesn't matter. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44 says, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. Think about that. See, that's pretty cool. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but we get raised in power. It's thrown in the ground as the natural body, but it gets raised as a spiritual body. What's natural has to come first, and then comes the spiritual. Just like Adam came in the natural, and Jesus was the spiritual after the resurrection. If there's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. Hmm. And right now, these bodies that we're in, I mean, they're incredible. I mean, they're incredibly made. If you even just stop to look at the eyeball and how it functions, it's just mind-blowing to ever right. think that that just happened on a coincidence. Right. You know, some sludge crawled out of a pond, and oh, wait, I need, I need lungs that exchange oxygen. You know, it, when you start studying the body, you are just amazed. But God says, yeah, but that's perishable. Hm. I made that like a seed. Is what he's saying. Drop it in the ground. It's going to go six feet under. It's going to die. And then this new life is going to come up. Stuff. Think about it. I mean, I'm telling you guys, it's the kind of stuff you have to watch six or seven times. And every time you're going, God, you're so good. I love watching these afterwards because I get so much out of what the Lord has dropped into me. It's just amazing. He's like that. It's like we always talk about comparing that to a diamond. You know, you turn it in the light and it's got different facets that you can just see different things at different times. And every time you listen to a word of God or hear something like that, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. God is so good like that. Verse 55, Paul makes a statement. He says about death, he says, Oh, death, where is your victory? <laughs> oh, death, where is your sting? Think about that. He's mocking death. He's saying, you know, Jesus died. He rose again. So what's scary about dying? It's like seeing a scorpion with its stinger removed. You know, like, oh, a little bit of... Or a bumblebee. Or whichever one stings you. I don't know much about bees, but whichever bee it is, you got a stinger in them. If you took the stinger out, it would be just this little fuzzy little thing, right? Let it crawl all over your hand. It's the same thing. Death has no sting because of what Jesus did at the resurrection. Why are we afraid of dying? And, and what happens, and hear me, our mind, when it gets renewed completely, and when I say that, it's because we're all in the process of renewing our mind. We're at different places, obviously. But when it gets renewed to the point where we're like, yeah, come on. I have I haven't been afraid of dying since I was eight years old. I've never I have not been afraid of dying. And I'm, like I said, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying that is something I, I believe that God has given me, but to do the things that I've done in my life. I've been in combat and I've had soldiers that were cowering in fear. And I'm going, come on, you know. But I know that God did that, and, and I know that you all can have that if we understand what we're saying here. So. It also, he's explaining how the sting of death was sin and how that's all been removed because of Jesus. Unless we want to keep trying to bring it back and bring it back and bring it back. Listen, guys, we're going to, we're going to, listen, we're not perfect. You're going to make mistakes. 
But don't be sin conscious. Where you're, it's all you're thinking about. Right. Oh, I'm sinning here. Oh, I'm sinning here. Lord, I'm not saved, I guess. I'm not. No, listen, guys. You have to know who you are in Christ. And you have to move on. You have to grow. You have to grow. Now, listen. Here's one thing I think about sometimes. Death would be scary if I didn't know him. Amen. Or for what, if he wouldn't have done that. If I thought, oh God, I'm dying, I'm sick, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be punished by God because I, I'm not saved. I have no salvation. That would be scary. Amen. But we know the truth. Lord. And the truth is what sets us free, right? Amen. <laughs> he did all of that for us. Easter is so awesome. We, I mean, we're, we're so excited. <laughs> Jesus did that. On the cross, he paid for my penalty. He paid for my penalty. And for those of us that believe in him, I, I can come to him at the end of my life and go, Jesus, I know I did so many horrible, horrible things, but Jesus paid for those. So I can walk boldly in there and go, whoo, thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to be... You know, I'll be running up there with you guys, all hugging his leg or whatever we can get to when everyone gets there. You know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. For God is so smart. He put all these things in place so it would happen this particular way. If we just say, yes, you're my Lord, you're my Savior. I want to do this. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I accept the free gift that you're giving me. So I look forward to that. All of this. Because one man rose from the grave. Amen. Think about that. Amen. So good. Amen. Now, I, I, I'm not saying you're not going to have tough times on the earth. Right. I'm not saying you're not going to go through things. You know, our, our, we're, we're born to die. Everybody understand that? When, when we're born on this planet, we know that we have a shelf life. We know that we are going to die. Everybody understands that. And we're going to go through things in a fallen world, and we're going to experience things in a fallen world, but we have free will enough on how we get to handle those. And listen, you can't beat someone up because they're dealing with it a different way. All we can do is we can minister to them, we can love on them, we can pray for them, we can agree with them. But that will that they have, God will never override your free will. And if they make a decision, hey, I'm, just, I, I'm tired. You know, I've been struggling, and I just, I'm tired. I just want to go home. And and they do. And, you know, and then we're, as family, as, you know, people like that, we're just like, oh, Jesus, what happened? What happened? You know, and that's one of those times where we get with the Lord, and the Holy Spirit really spoke to me about it was their will. They They, they just, they wanted to come home. And so... You know, and then we're left, and, then, and and let me be honest with you, I'll tend to be a little selfish and go, why did you leave? <laughs> you know? And so we love them. And they're, they're cheering us on right now, our cloud of witnesses. They're going, come on! Like, why'd you leave? Come on! You know, <laughs> back and forth. But it's an opportunity that we get as individuals. Because we, like, like I say all the time, you're going to stand in front of him by yourself. Amen. Your wife won't be there. Your husband won't be there. Your kids won't be there. It's you and God. The Lord, King of Kings. And that's when we get to, <laughs> he's going to love on you. He's going to give you a crown. Or he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I tried. I sent so-and-so to speak to you. I sent you here. I, I asked you this. I sent so-and-so many times. I've had, you've had every opportunity to say yes. And you know what? You were so selfish. You're like, you know what? Turn on the TV. No, you know what? I read the Bible. Oh, it makes me fall asleep. No, every opportunity I've given you to know me, you've shunned. So I don't know you. And, it's, and it breaks his heart as much as the terror that you're going to feel, it's going to break his heart. 
because he did everything possible, including rising from the dead for you. And the one thing you have is a choice to say, I accept what you did for me. That pride is ugly. Okay, so this is the part of the message where <laughs> I just want to tell you how good God is. Just how, how wonderful it is that I believe in the resurrection. And I just want to beg you. I just want to beg everyone else here to feel the same way. But you know what? As much as I ask, as much as I beg, you know, you got to believe this. You know, it's your choice. Because I know that there's people that still don't believe in God. And they'll go to church because they're trying to check that box, but they still don't believe in God. And I get tempted to argue with them. I get tempted, and I know you, some of you, I, I know this, there's, there's a little, you know, and, and, and it just, you know, here, let me give you some facts. Let me start comparing some facts with you so that you, let me tell you about some history. Let me tell you about these holy books. Let me tell you about what happened. You know, I want to start arguing with them, and I have to stop myself. Because Jesus gave me a good example of that. When he was on this planet, he used a phrase that no one else used. Only he used this phrase after he'd give a message. He says, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, I want you to think about that. He who has ears, let him hear. He said it all the time. No one else said it, just Jesus. It's a very important phrase because he would give a message and he would not try and argue with anybody. And you know they wanted to. You know they tried. Hmm. Sometimes he'd even give parables after a hard message to say, okay, listen, I'm going to give you this example, but what it basically comes down to is if you really want to understand it, you'll get it. And that's what he's saying. And sometimes I want to argue because some people come up and say, oh, I don't believe in Jesus because I watched the Da Vinci Code. And you're like, okay, you want to talk Da Vinci Code? Okay, I'm going to, we'll talk Da Vinci Code and I'm going to destroy it. You know, I want to argue and that type of thing, but, but I don't. It's such a joke, it doesn't even have to be destroyed. Da Vinci Code, I'm, if you've ever seen that or anyway. So funny, I was looking, I was doing some research online and the first thing that came up. Well, how can you explain the Da Vinci Code? And I was like, oh my goodness. So, here's the question. Here's what I'm talking about. If I can prove to you that the Da Vinci Code is a big joke, then will you believe in Jesus? No. Because then they'll move on to the Gospel of Judas, Right? They'll move on to all these different things. How about if I explain that also? Will it, then, will you believe in Jesus? Hmm. No, nope, you'll find something else. Well, it's because of all these hypocrites. Okay, so if I get rid of all the hypocrites in church, and you're the only one sitting there, will you believe in Jesus? No. No. Because you'll just keep going from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing. That's basically what Jesus was saying. Let he who has ears, let him hear. Because are these things really the issue? No. These things really aren't the issue. The truth is you don't really want to believe in Jesus. You really don't want to believe in Jesus. So you'll have all these excuses ready to go. And if there's one you can't answer, you'll say, well, I need to think on it. And you'll come up and you'll go home and you'll Google 50 other reasons why Jesus can't be real. That's right. hmm. I'm going to try and twist it. So Jesus says, you know, what does Jesus say? He goes, let him who has ears, let him hear. I'm not going to argue about it because he's talking about the condition of your heart. The condition of your heart. <sighs> if you don't believe in God, you won't. And that's why he says that. It's a good lesson for us because as we go out and we minister, we go on mission trips, we try and, and witness to people, you know, even here. I mean, you have people you go talk to and they start falling asleep on you. 
you know, they, they don't want to hear about it. And listen, that is their free will. That's their choice. They get the opportunity to hear who God is, what God's all about, and they just don't want to know that. So 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, here's what Paul said so simply. I just love it. What I received, I pass on to you. As of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That's it. That's his whole message. Beautiful, simple. That's the gospel. Amen. Think about that. It all boils down to this. Christ died for your sins. Then he was buried, then he rose again. Jesus died for you. I'm not going to convince you of that. I'm just going to tell you. I know it to be a fact. I'm just saying that's the truth. He was buried. Joseph took the body, put it in a tomb, and he was raised again. And he walked and he appeared to over 500 people. And their lives were completely changed after that. That's what happened. Christ died for your sins. Now, what does that mean? That means you've done some things that deserve punishment. We all have, correct? Isn't that right, Daniel? You've done things during your lifetime that deserve the wrath of God. God should punish you for those things but Christ died for you. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus paid for it. And there's a lot of people that say, you know what? I'm a good person. You know, Keanu Reeves, everyone raves about how good person he is, but he's a practicing Buddhist. You know, is he going to go to heaven? He doesn't know Jesus. So if he's practicing Buddhism, is he following Jesus? See, and these are simple questions, yes and no. And people will not say that. They will not say this out loud. Or they'll, well, here's what happens. They start in their mind, they start trying to smooth things over. Well, maybe he knows Jesus and he's just trying that out to see if that religion, you know, it, it, now listen. A little bit of poop in the cookie dough makes poopy cookies. Right, Beck? The Bible says, everyone on earth, everyone on earth has sinned against God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says, right? But then Jesus. Jesus died for us, and he rose again. <laughs> wow. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what do you get from that? You get that free gift. But you have to believe in your heart. Listen, it says the demons believe and they tremble. So what's the difference between the demons and someone else that says, oh, I believe. The demons will never make him their Lord and Savior. So there's that little aspect that people like to leave out. Are you serving the Lord? I go to church on Christmas and Easter. Now listen, guys, I'm not basing that on your attendance. Please hear my heart on this. What I'm saying is if you serve a Lord, if you serve a king, you will follow them and you will your, your, your whole life will change. Your whole atti attitude will change about other people. You'll want to know more. You'll want to learn more. You'll equip yourself to learn more so you can reach other people because you, you're not here just for you. Yeah. So there's a difference in your life. It's a complete difference in your life. Hmm. He proved to everyone when he rose again, he said, look, my words have meaning. I told you this would happen. Suddenly, I stand alone as the only person on this planet that was or ever will be that died and came back alive. And I did that for you. All right. One more thing. Mark 16, it's interesting because it's talking about the resurrection. And I'm just going to paraphrase real quick. The women go to the tomb to find Jesus, right? Alice mentioned this a little bit. But Jesus wasn't there, correct? Amen. All right. So the stone had been rolled away. They see an angel. And what does the angel tell them to do? He says, look, you're looking for Jesus, right? 
Jesus rose like he said he would. And then he tells these women, he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Think about that. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. Now, wait a minute. Peter's a disciple. What does that even mean? Peter was one of the disciples. But if you look at why he would single Peter out, it was my favorite. I just love this. I mean, the first time I heard this when I was probably 18 years old, it made such an impact on me. And every Easter, I remember this. Go and tell the disciples, oh yeah, and Peter. Because think about that. Just a, a few chapters before, Peter, you know, he was telling Jesus, Jesus, you know, I, I love you. I'm crazy about you. I will die for you, right? And Jesus goes, three times you'll deny me before the rooster crows, right? Yes. Everybody familiar with that? Right. Peter goes, give me a break. He goes, I will never deny you. I will die for you. I mean, he is, I'm, I'm sure he believed that, right? Yeah. Forget that. <laughs> I could just, I'm, I'm, I kept thinking of scenarios in my mind. Peter's going, what? <laughs> Jesus, come on. I will never deny you. And shortly after Jesus gets arrested and they start torturing him, Someone comes up to Peter and says, hey, aren't you one of his guys? He goes, what? No, I don't know him. You know, kind of walks away a little like, you know, because think about it. He's, he's looking and he's seeing. He's watching what's happening to Jesus. He's watching. He's a witness to what's going on. And he goes, if they do that to him, what are they going to do to me? I know, I, I can just, I can feel him almost. Suddenly, someone else comes up to him and goes, wait, 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 weren't you with Jesus? And he goes, listen, I didn't know the guy. And walks off. Walks off in the crowd watching and gets his, probably his, his cloak and pulls it over his head and is sitting there and he's watching just going, my gosh, what did we do? And then another person comes up and looks around the cloak at his face and goes, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? He goes, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. And suddenly a rooster crows. And it says, Jesus at that moment turned and looked right at him. And they made eye contact. And he realized, he just denied him three times when he swore he would die for him. Think about that. Peter just ran off, bawling probably just wailing, you know, they would tear their clothes, whatever, I'm sure. And he ran, he tried to hide. He tried to probably get as far away as he could. What did I do? Suddenly, people can't find him. He's gone. Hmm. Think about how disappointed Peter was at himself at that moment. Watching him being just sliced in half, cut open, bleeding everywhere, and hearing the rooster and just seeing him look, knowing that he had done exactly what he said he was going to do. And he swore, I will not do this. I will die for you. And now he's just running and hiding. He probably didn't even want to be counted as one of the disciples anymore. I'm not worthy. And then, Christ rises from the dead and says, Go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter probably thinks, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want anything to do with him. I made all those promises. Walked away from him. And the Lord's going, you know what? He messed up his life. He betrayed me. But go tell Peter I want him. I still want him. I love that because the truth is many of us have been in that situation. We've been in those times in our life, you know, especially those who come just on Easter. Think about that. People grew up in church, maybe. People maybe went to a church camp, you know, and they went down front, you know, and they, they, they gave their life to the Lord. And you said, I'll follow Jesus. 
Yes, I accept you, Jesus. I'll follow you. You know, absolutely. I'll die for him. I'll live a pure life. I accept you, Lord. I'm going to have this great family. We're going to serve the Lord together. And your life didn't go in that direction. It didn't happen the way you said it would. I'm never going to look at pornography again. Now you're addicted again. I'm never going to drink alcohol again. And now you're an alcoholic. You just went right back to that old way of life after telling God, I love you, God. I'll give you my life. I'll serve you. I'm gonna, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And you go right back. You did the exact opposite. And then you walk into a church, maybe on Easter, and you feel that shame come over you. You remember what you promised. And you realize what you're in the middle of, what you're doing in your life at that time. And you totally ditched the whole thing with Jesus. And you think, where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? But you know what? The resurrected Christ is saying to you today, tell everyone, especially tell him, Tell everyone, but especially tell her. I still want her. I still want him. It's an awesome thought. And that's why you're in this room. And that's why I'm saying what I'm saying to you today. And because I know what it meant to walk away from the Lord. I knew the Lord, and I walked away, and I did those things, and I lived a life I wanted to live. And I just became this hypocrite who could quote verses. It didn't change anything in my life about him resurrecting. Because I still wanted to live that life. I still wanted to be that person. Why would he pick me after everything I've done? And he still comes after me. And he wants to use me. And that's when I turned back around. And I stopped running the same direction. He was coming after me and I was running that way. Until I stopped and turned around and said, God, I can't do this anymore. And so now I ran to him. And that's when he said, thank you. Because now I've been waiting. I've been chasing you. I just want to hug you. I just want to use you. I get to be a small part of that now. And he's saying that to each and every one of you in this room today. I don't care what you did. I don't care what you're doing. He doesn't. He's chasing you. He's coming after you. He's saying, go tell them. I still want them. That's our God. That's Jesus. He knows what you've done. Not the edited version that you tell everybody, but the true version. And he still wants you. He still wants you. <laughs> you get that spirit that raised Christ from the dead inside of you, and he will help you become the person he put you on this earth to be. He will do it. He will do it. Some of their, you know, you'll sit there and you'll think, this isn't who I pictured myself to be at this point in my life. At this time in my life, I did not expect to be here. I expected so many different things. And God is saying, listen, give me you and I'll make you who I made you to be. It's not too late. It's not too late. And you'll sit here and say, man, look at their family. Look at, those, look at those guys. I want what they have. Listen, they were in your same position at some point. And at some point, they decided, you know, I'm going to give it to God. That's the difference. You get to choose. Because of the resurrected Christ, in every decision you make, you have so much choice, so much peace, all because of Jesus. You still have time. You still have a choice. And remember, it's not Saturday anymore. It's Sunday. He's not in the grave. He's risen, 
And because of that, you have freedom. You have a free gift waiting for you. And listen, please don't put any limitations on yourself because he's not. If you're a couple, work together. If, if, you are, if you're a widower, you have a family here that you're a part of. If, you, if you're by yourself, if you're looking for a partner, listen, the Lord will help you with that. 